How many of you guys have ever lost your, you, you, you were getting ready for work or something and your keys, you just couldn't find your keys anywhere and you look around and it becomes the one thing you're focused on because you've got to get to work. It's the one thing, everything else stops because you've lost your keys and you look around for them for a half an hour and then you realize they're in your pocket the whole time. How many of you guys ever done that before? Yeah. There's, a, there's some scriptures in the Bible, some stories in the Bible that Jesus told. We call them parables. They just simply mean stories about some people who had lost some things. And in Luke chapter 15, we're going to start there first. Some of you guys are familiar with this story. It says, what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he's lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that's lost until he finds it? And when he's found it, He lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing, and when he comes home, he calls together his friends, his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. What he's trying to paint a picture here is that there are certain times in our life where everything else shuts down. And there's certain things in our life that rise above everything else where they become the one thing. And it doesn't matter if you had uh, 99 other sheep, but there was one that was lost and it became all priority. Next story that he tells is right after this. He says, or what woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house, seek diligently until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me, for I found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you that there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Then he goes into that next story, which many of you guys have probably heard before, the prodigal son story about the son who strayed away and then came back. What he's trying to paint a picture here is that there are certain times in our life, there are certain things in our life that are so valuable, they're so valuable that they begin to affect They begin to rearrange how we do things, when we do things, and why we do things. There are some things in our life that are so valuable that it begins to rearrange when we do things, how we do things, why we do things. And Paul, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 is going to tell us one of those things that becomes so valuable that it begins to rearrange when we do things, how we do things, and why we do things. So let's look at this in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but have not love. You see, love is one of those things that's so valuable that it rearranges when we do things, how we do things, why we do things. You could, you could have all these spiritual gifts we talked about last week, but if you don't have love, I'm just a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. In other words, you may, in, in your own mind, you may sound great, but to everyone else, you're just annoying. How many of you guys have a friend like that? I mean, they think they're great, but everyone else knows this is the annoying friend, right? They don't get invited to things. They wonder why. It's because they're like that clanging cymbal. Well, some people are like this spiritually is what he's saying. And if I have all prophetic powers, and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, And if I have all faith, all these are great things, aren't they, by the way? I mean, these are great things to have spiritual gifts and faith and and all these things. If I have faith to move mountains, just like Jesus talked about, but I don't have love, I'm nothing. These are pretty strong statements, aren't they? I mean, you could be doing a lot of things right, and if you don't have this one thing, this one thing, then it just doesn't count for anything. If I give away all I have, if I'm like the rich young ruler that Jesus talked to and he said, give away everything you've got, or if we were like the book of Acts church and we just gave away everything we had to to help the poor, but we don't have love, it doesn't count. That's what Jesus is saying. Or that's what Paul's saying. Isn't that amazing? How one, you, you take out one thing out of the picture and it changes everything. It says, even if I deliver my body to be burned, if I become a martyr for Jesus, but yet in the martyrdom, I didn't actually have love. I was just going through what I'm supposed to be doing and I'm just begrudgingly. If I have no love, it doesn't even count. This is pretty strong words. He says, I gain nothing. So this is the one thing that he talks about here that it begins to rearrange our priorities of how we do things, when we do things, why we do things. So the question I have for you this morning is how intensely are you pursuing love? See, we we pursue a lot of other things, but how intensely are you pursuing love? How valuable is love? You know, a few months ago, I went on vacation. I went to Florida, and if I went down there, and on my way back, I realized that I left my sunglasses there on the beach halfway back. I'm in Nashville, Tennessee. Do you think I'm going to go back for those sunglasses? No, no. They were $5 at Walmart. I'm not going to go back for those sunglasses. But 
if I got halfway back and I got back to Nashville and I realized I left one of my kids there, I guess, no, I'm, if I'm a good dad, I'm probably thinking something like that because every good dad would say, well, I've got four more kids. What's one? You know, <laughs> what? Yeah, I got four more because I have five kids. And so, no, that's not what would happen, would it? I mean, everything would stop. Every, we would turn around. It wouldn't matter what was on the calendar. It wouldn't matter how much gas money it took. Everything would stop, and we would be turning around, pursuing that. I mean, what does it matter what kind of vacation I have or how much money I have? If one of my kids were there and I had left them, all of a sudden it becomes a one-thing priority. Paul is saying that love is like that, that it's a one-thing priority, that it ought to stop you in your tracks. And here's what I want you to catch this morning. The intensity of the search is determined by the value of what's lost. If my sunglasses are lost, I'm not searching very intensely for them. But if one of my kids are lost, everything's on, isn't it? And I become extremely intense, and it's based on the value of what's lost. Now, here's the question I have for you today. How valuable is love? You know how valuable it is by how intensely you're pursuing it. You see, and we can also measure other things in our life, how much we value them, whether it be career or sports or, uh, you know, relationships, whatever it is, by how intensely we're pursuing them. The intensity of the search is determined by the value of what's lost. How valuable is love? Because here's the truth, guys. It's easy for us to misplace our love, isn't it? It's easy for us to look back one day and realize, oh, I left my love on vacation, <laughs> I came back to work and my love was down on the beach somewhere. And it's easy for us to put our love in other places. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13 at the very end says this, So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. What he's saying here is this, that love is one of the few things that will last into eternity. Your career won't, money won't, possessions won't, your accolades won't, love, faith, hope, and love. These are some of the few things that will last into eternity. Most things won't. These are one of the few things. It's one of the things that needs to last. And so we need to turn a love that's lost in our life into a love that lasts. How many of you guys would like to hear a little bit more about how to have a love that lasts? Because I want to give you three things I believe that are characteristics of a love that lasts. First one is this. A love that lasts values people over mission. Whatever your mission is. If it's a job, if it's a, a hobby, if it's a cause, if it's a whatever. Values people over mission. If we look at the last verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, which we looked at last week, and then we go to 1 Corinthians 14, obviously, surprise, chapter 13 is in the middle of those, Right? But here, I'm going to read them back to back as if chapter 13 was not there. Here we go. But earnestly, this is starting in chapter 12, and we'll end in the first one in, in 14. But earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you still a more excellent way. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. Here's what most people do. The pursuing love is an afterthought. Most of us, it says to earnestly desire spiritual gifts. Most of us desire or pursue gifts. We pursue a cause. We pursue a career. And then we desire love to go along with it. That's opposite. We're told to pursue love and then desire these other things. We've got it backwards. We've got it upside down because it's easy to misplace our love. You see, in their culture, in the Corinthian culture, which is, you know, back at the city of Corinth, Paul had planted a church in the city of Corinth. That's why this book is written. And in their culture, they had something like the Olympic Games. It was second to the Olympic Games, the Isthmian Games. And they were, there were athletes there training all the time. There was uh, a lot of things going on for, for athletes and, and Olympics and sports and all that stuff. It was easy in that culture for them to get sidelined and put their love in a sport put their love in, in activity and recreation. Listen, guys, today, how many of you guys know we have that same temptation? It doesn't matter if it's, how many, some of you guys watched the fight last night. Some of them aren't here who watched the fight because their love was in, the, it was in that. And, and there's nothing wrong with those things until they become the one thing, until our youth sports becomes the one thing, until our uh, football game becomes the one thing, until whatever it is, 
I know I, I don't make too many popular, I don't have, I'm not too, very popular when I say things like that. I've had many people leave the church when I say things like that. You'd be surprised. Because we've made idols out of them. They have become the one thing. In their culture, it was no different. Or in their culture, they also, uh, they had the, all these grand speakers and philosophers come in and they valued intellectual knowledge. They valued philosophy. They valued intellect. And so it was easy in their culture for them to put their love in pursuit of knowledge. And in our day, it's the same thing. We have the same temptation to do the same thing. In their day, they had false gods and false idols that they literally worshiped. Again, we have the same thing. We just call them other things, don't we? We just, we just call them other, by other names, but they're no less an idol in our life. And so we have all these things that they had, materialism, all these things. And they lived in a culture of misplaced love. Misplaced love creates brokenness in our life. You may be going through life right now and you just don't understand why don't the pieces fit together. It's because you've misplaced your love. You've put your love in the wrong place. And he begins to tell the church, he said, guys, if you're not careful in the church, it's easy for you to do the same thing. Only here's the catch. It's easy for you to do it, not in all those worldly things, but in spiritual things. It's easy for us who know Jesus. Many of us have rejected all those other things, but he says it's easy for you to put your hope and your love and to misplace it in gifts of the Spirit, in the mission of God, even the cause of God, the Bible, all these things that are great things. But it's easy for us to put our love in there, and it becomes our one thing. And that's what he's dealing with right here. That's the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's not the wedding chapter, by the way. It's not the love, 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 even though we use it at weddings. It's about this topic right here. And when, when people begin to love the gifts of the Spirit more than people who they're for, that's a problem. When people begin to love uh, their cause uh, that, they're, that they're championing more than the people, that's a problem. When people begin to love the Bible even more than God, you say, how's that? No, it's possible for us to, to love the Bible. Oh, I love reading the Bible. Well, it's not changing me. It's because there's no relationship with God. And so we put our love in all of these different things and even good things, great things. I think it was Augustine who said something like this, that he was, that at one point I was in love with love. How many of you guys have ever met somebody who's in love with just wanting to be in love? <laughs> They're just focused on a relationship. I'm just in love with love. Uh, years ago, we lived in town. We lived in a small house, a small yard, and we just loved. We didn't have any dogs, but we wanted to have a dog. We just loved the thought of, of like having a dog sitting there in your house and playing Frisbee with the dog and all this type of stuff. And so we got this, this dog. I can't remember the order that we got these dogs. I said there's multiple dogs. One, one dog that we got because we, we thought, well, let's, let's do this. We, we, we love dogs. And so we got this dog, and this dog figured out we had a four-foot fence and he, that he could actually jump over the fence. So he would jump over the fence and end up somewhere in town. We tried to put him back in, tried to skirt, all this stuff. He kept jumping over the fence, so we finally had to get rid of him because we couldn't keep him in the fence. And so we were like, well, I guess we don't love dogs. But then after a while, we just kind of started, man, we kind of want a dog. We, we like dogs. We want to have a dog. And so we got this other dog, and uh, the utility worker was coming in to check the utilities, and our dog bit the utility worker, and so he had to go to dog jail. And uh, eventually, we had to get rid of that dog, and so a little time goes by, and we're like, man, I guess we're not dog people. And so then we, we started to, well, we really want a dog. And so we got this other dog. It was a golden retriever. How can we go wrong with this? And this golden retriever, the only problem was it just barked all the time, nonstop. Whenever we'd leave the house, it would just bark until my neighbor finally came over at midnight one time, cussing me out at midnight. And we had to send that dog off to a farm somewhere. It's like, we're not, I guess we're not dog people, you know? Now we have three dogs, but I guess we're not dog people. What we realized back then, because we've changed now, what we realized back then is we, we didn't so much love dogs. We loved the idea of having a dog. We loved the idea of a dog out in the backyard playing Frisbee. But when it came down to it, we didn't really love the experience of having a dog. We didn't love all the messes. We didn't love all the trouble. I think that's where a lot of people are with love. They, they, they love the idea of 
loving people and loving God. But when it comes down to it, when it, when it comes down to the hard part of actually loving people, we find out we, didn't, we don't really love people. We love the idea of what it's like when we love people, but we don't necessarily love people. Can anybody relate? You don't have to raise a hand, but if you're bold enough, I'm raising my hand because I've been there before. Okay, one person, thank you. Two, I'll take that. Uh, can I get three? Can I get anybody else? Anybody, thank you. There we go. Now all the people who are, yeah, not liars. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Because we can be in love with the gospel mission and not the people for whom the mission is for. We can love the idea of salvation. We can love the idea of Jesus coming to rescue. We can love the idea of that and still not love the people. It's kind of like, I think there are so many people maybe today that start off right and our hearts are right and we do love people, but over time it begins to change. It's kind of like this thing I saw on the internet this week, this picture of this, it says, uh, you matter, don't give up. That's a good sign. That's how we start until you start to read it differently. You don't matter, give up. <laughs> and <laughs> I think that's what happens over time to a lot of us. We start off with the right heart, but then something happens. We begin to misplace our love when we put it in places it ought not be. Love that lasts loves people over the mission. And we we have this idea, and here's what Paul's really trying to communicate throughout this, this letter. In all of your doing, don't forget who you're being. You're doing a lot of things. I know everybody here is busy. Everybody here is doing a lot of things. In all of your doing, don't forget who you're becoming while you're doing. Because what's really important is who you're becoming, not what you're doing. And, and love that lasts, the God kind of love, it's all about who you're being, not what you're doing. Because what you're doing doesn't mean anything if there's not love. If there's not love. All right, the second thing about love that lasts is this. Love that lasts moves us beyond emotion into action. Now, we have trouble un- understanding love because it's an overused word. We think of like unconditional love, and we think unconditional love sometimes means that, well, we should never confront people or challenge people or tell them what they're doing is wrong. We should just con- unconditionally let them be how they are. And, and we just unconditional love. Well, that doesn't apply to other areas of life. You say, well, it's loving just to unconditionally love people and not ever challenge people. Or, and so we had this misunderstanding. If we apply that to some other area of our life, like the highway, like driving. How many of you guys have ever, you know, you thought, well, maybe I just had to have unconditional love for people. And we don't do that with our laws. We just say, well, you know, it's loving to let people just drive however they want, however fast they want. No, because that's not real love. We know that there needs to be some boundaries. So we have misunderstandings. In our culture today, right now, one of the big misunderstandings is that love equals tolerance. Well, if, if, you don't, if you don't agree or agreement even, and we have that, that big buzzword of tolerance and tolerance as if somehow that's really the deepest meaning of love is that if we really love people that we will tolerate them however they are and whatever lifestyle they have and whatever they choose to do with their life and whatever it is, that we think love equals tolerance. But in our deepest heart, we know that's not what really love is. I mean, last year, my wife and I, we went on our 20th anniversary, went on, on that trip to Colorado. We went there, had a great time. We, we sat down for our anniversary dinner. And you know, if I would have sat there at that moment, 20 years of marriage, and I would have looked her in the eyes and said, said something like this just to express how much I loved her. I said, honey, I tolerate you. I'm probably finding my own ride home, don't you think? That's probably because we know that's not what love really is. There's elements of it, sure, but we get all confused. So so we've got to understand what love is. And Paul begins to tell us what love is. And here's here's the definition of really love. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4: Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude, does not assist on its own way, it's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. 
Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And verse 8 starts off and says, love never ends. Those are some pretty strong, that's pretty strong language and depth to it. It's not a flippant thing. You see, most of us think of love more as infatuation or sentimentality. And, and so I, it's kind of like this letter I, I I uh, found this week of this lady who had had, had a breakup with her uh, engagement, and so she's trying to get back with her, uh, her love. And so it's, it goes like this. Dearest Jimmy, no words could ever express the great unhappiness I've felt since breaking our engagement. She's really distraught, you know. Please say that you'll take me back. No one could ever take your place in my heart, so please forgive me. I love you, I love you, I love you. Yours forever, Marie. P.S. And congratulations on winning the state lottery. <laughs> because we're based more on emotion, right? Our love is more up and down based on our emotions than it is on what Paul just talked about here. Because I think a lot of us grew up with this picture perfect fairy tale version of love, this even romantic love, if you will, the Disney version of love, I call it, the fairy tale version, which you know what a fairy tale is? It's a lie, okay? It's a lie. It's not true. And we grow up with that expectation. That's kind of how we interact. But real love, love that lasts, moves us beyond emotion into action. Let me give you some challenges right now. You guys ready? Buckle your seatbelt right now for just a little bit because I'm, I'm going to challenge you. You can take it, though. Okay, well, you can take it. Love that moves us beyond emotion into action. You, you say on Facebook that you love your brother or sister in Christ. You're going to be praying for them. Oh, man, I'm all for you. Oh, I, I feel your pain. When was the last time you visited them in the hospital? You said, well, well, Sean, that's your job. That's why we pay you. I guess you don't read your Bible, do you? When's the last time you brought them a meal or did something beyond just a like? You see, so many of us need to move beyond like into love. All like keeps you into is inaction, but love moves you into action. It moves you beyond emotion. It says, I feel your pain, and so I am going to enter into that pain in some way, shape, or form. I'm going to do something about that. When was the last time someone was speaking wrongly to you, but because you had real love for them in your heart, you went ahead and spoke life into them anyway? See, love is not an emotion. Love moves us beyond, love that last moves us beyond emotion into action, into that territory where you think it's unfair, where you think it's not justified, you think that you have re Love moves us beyond that territory and moves us into real action, the God kind of action. You say you love the church. I love the church. I love the people of the church. When was the last time you did something practically to link arms with the church? Because you can like the church all you want, but when you love, you, it moves you into action. It moves you into something beyond emotion. It moves you into doing something. When was, you say you love people who don't know Jesus. When was the last time you did something practically to enter into their world to do something that moves you beyond the emotion? You say you like, well, I, I, you know, the Bible says widows, orphans, you know, kids and, and sex trafficking. When was the last time you moved beyond just the, the emotion of it and entered in the world? Listen, I know we all have different callings. I'm not saying that everyone does the same thing. But what I am saying is when you say you have love, is it real love? Because real love will move you beyond the emotion of it and move you into some sort of corresponding action with it. It's kind of like the great theologians of that, that band DC Talk <laughs> who said love is a verb. It's true. Love brings us into action. Here's the thing about the body of Christ. You don't get to choose who your family is. How many of you guys in your natural family, you have somebody crazy in your natural family? All right. If you didn't raise your hand, you're that person. <laughs> Just so you know. Just so you know. Why? Because you were born into the family. You don't get a choice. But you still have to love them. 
Listen, when you, when you have salvation come into your heart, you, when Jesus saves you, you are born into a spiritual family. And the people in this room and the people in first service and the people in, in the service tonight, if you're a journey church, this is your home, listen, these are our family. We don't get to choose them. They just keep showing up. I know, I see them all. And there's some unique people. I just, I just, they're not in this service. Don't worry, they're not in your service. They're in the other services. But you don't get to choose because love is not based on emotion. It, it's family. The Bible says what? Jesus said, you shall love them by their, by love, you shall know them by their love one for the other. So let me give you a very painful test. And believe me, I've, I've taken the test too. And it's not, the results aren't necessarily pretty, but would you do this with me? I borrowed these from a friend of mine, uh, Lee up in Michigan. He's a pastor up there. Uh, and it's just based on these things we looked at. That's kind of the love test. So let's, let's get into these 10 questions to see where our love is at. Number one, are you, patience with, are you patient with others' slow progress and growth? Because we have a lot of people around us who we think, man, why aren't these people getting to it a little bit faster? Why aren't they, why isn't it clicking with them? Are you patient with others' slow progress and growth? Number two, are you kind to others even when they are not kind? It's a very simple thing. Number three, do you struggle with envying what others have? In our culture, this is so hard not to do and because we're exposed to it all the time. Number four, do we use exaggeration or boasting to elevate ourselves? Because love doesn't boast. Number five, do you think more highly of yourself than perhaps you should? Say, well, I'm up here and everybody's down here. Number six, have you had more than one person tell you that you are rude? <laughs> it's a good test right there. Number seven. This is a big deal, guys. This, number seven is really hard. Can you submit to what others want, even when you have a strong opinion? It's really, really difficult. I know for me, it is. Number eight. Do you get cranky when you don't get your way? <laughs> Number nine, do you hold grudges against others because love keeps no record of wrong? Number 10, do you ever secretly celebrate when bad things happen to others? So in other words, we wouldn't do it externally, would we? But maybe on the inside, we're like, yeah, see, it just proves my point. This is a really challenging thing, isn't it? It sounded so flowery, right, at the wedding, but here it sounds a little bit more deep, right? It sounds a little bit more like there's a lot more meat to this. It sounded so poetic. Now it's hitting me where I don't want it to hit me. This is real stuff. You say it's impossible. I find it impossible to love. You don't understand, Sean. I've been hurt. I've been whatever. You don't understand. I've tried love. I've, I've went out of my way even when people are. I've tried that all before. You say it's impossible. And I would say you're right. It is. It is impossible without point number three. Here's point number three. Love that lasts has to have a Jesus that's first. Love won't last until Jesus is first. Anytime we find ourselves deficient in love, it's because somewhere something has taken the place of that one thing priority of Jesus. So let's finish up the chapter. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8, love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. Which, by the way, this is a good, uh, a good uh, point to say that obviously these gifts haven't passed away because we're still learning things. And so that's just a little side note. For we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, I believe the perfect means Jesus Christ because he is perfection, the perfect spotless lamb. The partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now, we see in a mirror dimly. But then we'll get to see, I, I believe this means Jesus face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall, full, shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. And then here's what that first verse, or that last verse we read earlier. So now faith, hope, and love abide these three. But the greatest of these is love. The greatest of these is love. What he's saying here is that this love thing, again, is one of the few things that will last into eternity. This love thing is what the future 
kingdom of God, but it will be forever, that's coming from the future to the present. That's what it's all about. You see, we get to be, as prophetic people, we get to live prophetically now what will be then. How many of you guys have ever tried to learn a, a language from another country? Anybody tried to learn language? When, well, the, it's horrible to try to learn language in a class. I, I was, uh, my family was missionaries to Mexico uh, when I was 15. And so as a part of that, I had a translator who was with us all the time as we were going in and out of Mexico. So I got to ask him any question. Well, of course, you start off by asking questions like, how do you say, where's the bathroom, right? Because these are important things. What, food, give me food. I, Coke, you know, how do you, I need food and drink. And so you start off there. But eventually, he taught us how to sing in Spanish. And so you could memorize a song, and I could actually lead worship in Spanish. That was pretty cool. Then pretty soon, I started to learn enough of the language that as we were in grocery stores and stuff, and there were people speaking Spanish, I could actually understand what they were saying, even though I couldn't say what they're saying. You guys follow me? I could hear what they're saying. I was like, I, I understand what they're saying. I couldn't say it, but I understand it. And that was pretty cool. Then I finally realized that I was actually learning the language and becoming part of the culture when I actually dreamed half of my dream in Spanish. And I understood it. I'm like, wow, I am really acclimating to this language. That's a picture of the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, the language is love. That's the language. God is love. And the language of the kingdom is love. You shall know them by their love. Love, if God is love, then the language is love. That's the language that will exist into eternity. That's the language we'll speak in all of eternity. And when we get saved, at first, we don't know the language very well. We only may know a little bit. But the hope is, as you begin to grow in God, that pretty soon you start to become more fluent in the language of the kingdom of God. That the further you go into it, you don't just still know where's the bathroom. You, you all of a sudden, you begin to dream in the language of the kingdom. You begin to dream, have dreams that are motivated by love. Is anybody following me this morning? This is, this is what we are called to do, to live prophetically now what will be. And here's what God is. God is love. I want you to get this this morning, that God's act of love towards us was one-sided. In other words, he did not demand that we do anything in return before he loved us. God's type of love does not require any participation on our own. God's type of love does not require us to reciprocate it. And love can be given away without anybody doing things in return in our own relationships. The problem is we don't do it that way. We only love someone if there's a corresponding benefit from them or the hope of it. That's not the God kind of love. That's not the God kind of love that's represented here. H how do we do that? How do we do that? I believe this, and this, some of you guys really need to catch this this morning. I believe love happens at three miles per hour. Love happens at three miles per hour. Some people are beach people. Some people are mountain people. How many of you guys are beach people? All right. How many of you guys are mountain people? You guys are my people right there. I go to the beach. I'm thinking, what is this? This is like taking one really big bath. This is not, I'm done. That's it. You know, I don't know what else to do. And mountains, I can climb them. I can jump off stuff. I can throw stuff and burn stuff and stuff like that. Yeah, that's right. I don't know what you're clapping for, but that's good. That's good. I like that. Love happens at three miles per hour. In the ancient world, when Jesus was on the planet, he walked everywhere he went. He didn't get in a car and drive someplace. He didn't get in an airplane and fly over someplace. He walked everywhere he went. People estimate that humans walk at about three miles per hour. I believe many of us are running too fast in life. We're running too fast in life. And it's time for us to slow down to catch up to Jesus. We're running too fast. See, Jesus in his ministry, he would do ministry. He would do, 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 do things. Serve, serve, serve. Heal, heal, heal. And then he would pull aside. And he would withdraw to the mountain. So for me, 
Years ago, I went to Bear Lake up in around Estes Park. How many of you guys have been there? So if you guys, all right, hold up your hand. You know where Bear Lake is? You know the trailhead at Bear Lake that leads you on up to Flat Top Mountain. How many of you guys know Flat Top Mountain? Not, has anybody climbed up the trail to Flat Top Mountain? Anybody else? One, one person. It's a stretch. It's a, it's a strenuous hike. Uh, it's about four something miles one way and then come back down. So it's an eight, eight plus mile round trip. Strenuous. Well, one day it was really snowy out and just, I mean, just a, a whole bunch of snow. I drove up to Bear Lake by myself, and I decided I'm going to hike up Flat Top Mountain by myself. And there was snow. It was so deep, and I saw a ranger. No one was there. No one was there. And I saw a park ranger, and I asked him if the trail was open. He said, yeah, it's open, but the problem is if you don't know where you're going, if you don't know where the trail is, you'll get lost. And if you get up to, to higher elevation, it's really it's a lot of drop-offs. And if you don't know where you're going, you'll probably just fall off the mountain. And so he went on, and so I said, all right, let's go. And so I started hiking up the mountain by myself. I was the only one there. And as I began to hike up four miles in the trees, finally you come out of the trees. And sure enough, I'm there on the side of the mountain with all this snow. I can't see the trail. I'm, I'm trying to find it the best I can just by looking at things and what I remember. I make it all the way up to the top. I'm just by myself for hours. Something about those times by myself, especially for me in the mountains. Maybe for you, it's the beach. But it's those times when I slow down and I come aside, just like Jesus did, where all of a sudden, all of my priorities, you guys ever had this happen before, where all of your priorities just become crystal clear? And just for one minute, in the midst of all the noise, I could just see life for what it really was and see the importance of what I was really doing and what wasn't important anymore. Just me and Jesus. I walked all the way back down. And I think it's those, our, our pace and our space affect our race sometimes, don't they? It's like how, how fast we're going and how dense we're living affects those priorities. It affects that Jesus being first in our life. We think faster, more. God thinks slower, deeper. Have you guys ever noticed that it's harder to, it, it's, it's, let me put it this way. It's easier to be rude to people when you're moving fast, isn't it? When you're just, you're so busy and you're so stressed, isn't it a lot easier to be rude to someone, to dismiss someone, to not show them love? Why? Because we're moving too fast. And listen, I know, <laughs> I know all of us have reasons why we can't slow down, but I'm telling you that so many of us, l love happens at three miles per hour. We need to slow down and just begin to walk with Jesus again. Walk with Jesus. You say, I, I can't walk with Jesus. I've got too much going on. I, let that be your prayer. God, give me those moments. Have you guys ever had this happen? Like in the middle of the night sometimes, I'll wake up just out of the, just in the darkness by my, just, just in my own thoughts, just waking up in the night. And all of a sudden, it's like in that moment, Everything about my priorities becomes crystal clear. And for a window, I can just think about what's important and what's not. I think about my relationship with God. Has anybody else had this happen just in the middle of the night? It's, that's the way it works for me. What, what's, what's going on there? God got me so slowed down, sometimes he has to catch me in the middle of the night because I'm running too fast. Sometimes I'll wake up in the middle of the night with crystal clarity about what is the most important things. We need to slow down to catch up to Jesus because love happens at three miles per hour. I mean, it's in those moments, guys, that, that Jesus, you guys are familiar with that story of Mary and Martha and Jesus comes to their house and Martha's working, she's doing all this stuff and Mary's at the feet of Jesus and Martha goes to, to Mary, Jesus, why don't you tell Mary to help me? There's so much to do. And Jesus says, she's got the one thing. She's got it. It's in those moments when I pull aside, when I slow it down, when I wake up in the middle of the night, that all of a sudden Jesus turns my Martha into a Mary spirit. And for just a, a small moment, I know it's right. And the struggle is when I come out of that, will I keep it? Will I keep it? Revelation chapter 2, verse 4. I want to have the worship team come back up. Revelation chapter 2, verse 4 says, I have this one thing against you, that you've abandoned the love you had at the first. I know maybe at the first you had this one thing priority where everything was crystal clear. Everything was clear. 
But in, somewhere in your doing, you forgot who you were being. And you say, Sean, I don't have time to slow down. I don't have time to slow down to catch up to Jesus. Here's what I want to do. You're here right now. We've got just a little bit of time left. Most of your kids are somewhere else. Can we take just a moment and ask God to reset, hit the reset button in our heart again? Can we take just a moment and say, God, here I am. I'm slowing down right now. You can do this. Everybody could do it right now. We just slow down to catch up to Jesus. Jesus, I want you to be my one thing. Before we ever pray that prayer of God, break my heart for what breaks yours, we need to pray a prayer again that says, God, break my heart for you. God, let, let my heart just burn for you again. Lord, I want you to be my one thing. So here's what I saw as I was preparing. I saw this in the spirit as I was preparing this week. And I just saw people coming down to the altar, some kneeling, some standing, but just having a moment to come aside, even if it's five minutes this morning. If that's all you have, by faith, give it to God. And just to reset that one thing priority. So as we sing this song, I'm gonna invite you, if you feel led, to just come and kneel before God. Maybe you need to kneel there at your seat if there's not room. And just say, God, I'm slowing down to catch up to you again. Lord, fill me up with your love, the love for people, the love for you. In all my doing, Lord, help me to remember who you've called me to be. So Lord, we just thank you this morning for your faithful love towards us. And Lord, we slow down right now to walk with you again. Lord, we want you to be our one thing where all other things fade into the peripheral. All other things fade into the background. Some of you need to recommit your life to the Lord as you come down. That's fine. You can do that right there. You don't need somebody to, to do that. You can just surrender your heart to Jesus right there and say, God, I'm all yours now. Some of you just need to come down and get a fresh filling from the Holy Spirit. Some of you need to just come down and just sit in the presence of God just for a moment before you go any further. So Lord, we thank you for what you're gonna do right now in Jesus' name.